Salutations, listener, and welcome to another edition of the Coco and Dolls podcast. I'm not Coco. And I'm not Dolls. We are real people with real reviews. And today we've got something very exciting in this episode for you. Coco, give them the 411 if you could. It is exciting. We today are reviewing Judas and the Black Messiah, which was just released simultaneously on HBO Max and in theaters yesterday, February 12th. <gasps> theater? What's what's that? <laughs> I don't know if we're ever going to another theater again. No, me neither. <laughs> they were kind of dodgy to begin with, some of the ones around us anyway. Yeah, but... You know, popcorn and milk duds and... And freedom. And freedom, yeah. Will we ever get back there? Sorry, I sidetracked you. Okay. So Judas and the Black Messiah is the based on true events story of Fred Hampton, who was the chairman of the Illinois Black Panther Party back in the 60s. He was assassinated by the FBI, the Chicago PD, and like the Illinois State's Attorney's Office. Um This is the story of him, kind of his rise to prominence, how he was able to form a rainbow coalition of groups that should not have worked (laughs) together in any stretch of the imagination. And also the story of William O'Neill, who was the FBI informant who basically killed (laughs) Fred Hampton. He's the Judas. Yeah, he's the Judas in the story. So... Bill O'Neill is played by Lakeith Stanfield, Fred Hampton is played by Daniel Kaluuya, and FBI agent Roy Mitchell, who is Bill O'Neill's FBI agent, like, contact. Uh, Roy Mitchell is played by Jesse Plemons. Mm -hmm. And then J. Edgar Hoover is played by Martin Sheen in Bad Prosthetics. With lots of stuff on his face. Yeah, with lots of stuff on his face. Mm -hmm. So that's... Those three are the big three, and then Martin Sheen like dips in and out a little bit, and that's pretty much the main cast right there. With uh, Dominique Fishback plays Fred Hampton's uh, girlfriend, Deborah Johnson. She's a pretty big big player in there as well. So, mm-hmm. Daltz, what did you think about Judas and the Black Messiah? So I didn't really know a lot about this movie. Uh, you dragged me into seeing it, Coco. I did as... because Daltz thinks that I am obsessed with black culture. Well, so if, if you are, that's fine. <laughs> Let's just just go with it. But um, it's a very important movie uh, historically. You know, these kinds of events uh, are very important. I When I was watching it, I felt like it was kind of like uh, an African-American Donnie Bros- Brasco in terms of the Johnny Depp movie where he was the informant and, and you know, worked his way into the mob kind of thing. The, the conflict, the inner conflict that... Um, uh, O'Neill uh, faced in the in his uh, you know informing on the Black Panther Party and getting to know um, Fred Hampton and liking him and getting to know everybody around it. I mean, it's kind of a classic story in the you know rat world where the rats get close to the to the subjects that they're informing on. Um, I thought it was I thought it was fine. I I wasn't really blown away by it. I think there was a lot of. Uh, grandstanding moments where you know the big speeches and things like that that i think that they should be more of a climax to the movie rather than step by step through the movie so i i thought that that was a little bit jarring to me um but i thought daniel kaluuya his performance was fantastic i thought he was great i had trouble understanding him sometimes his accent was uh like the way the audio was mixed i think was a little bit troublesome for me i had trouble hearing him i Sorry to break in. I did listen to an NPR podcast about this movie, and one of the hosts is from Chicago, and mm-hmm. she said that he nailed the Chicago accent. Yeah, she said yeah. she's known many black men from Chicago who sounded exactly like him. Oh, yeah. So she said he did a fantastic job on yeah, that. Yeah, I think, I think he was great. His performance was great. And he's originally from England, right? So he's uh, putting on an American accent, and he did it admirably. I, th- I really like him. He was good in Get Out, and he's been good in other stuff that we've mm-hmm. seen. So I really like him as an actor. Uh, I thought he was the highlight for me. Uh, Lakeith... Um, Stanfield. Stanfield was was pretty good he was you know weaselly in appropriate times and <laughs> right. and uh uh guilty in other times uh I th- and he's the, he's the main character in the movie he's the movie's uh focus so i thought he was pretty decent um but i just really i don't know that the the sum of the parts wasn't there for me i thought it was i thought it was fine mm-hmm. i thought it was good but what did you think Coco? what your imp- opinion is more important <laughs> than mine on this one so i liked it as mm-hmm. well i didn't 
like super duper love it, mm-hmm. but I really enjoyed it as much as you can enjoy a story about oppression and assassination. Right. <laughs> um, right. I I thought Daniel Kaluuya does a great job in everything. Yeah. He's uh, been in Get Out, as you mentioned. He was phenomenal in that. He was in Black Panther, mm-hmm. <laughs> not Black Panthers, but the Marvel movie Black Panther. <laughs> he was in Widows, like everything he's been in. He's he was been great, great in Widows too. Yeah. Yeah. I thought he was good in this. I actually enjoyed Lakeith Stanfield. Mm-hmm. Um, Daniel Kaluuya had the part that was like more meaty to sink your teeth right. into with right. all the, like you said, the speeches about I am a revolutionary and, mm-hmm. you know, getting the, the call and answer from, you know, the uh, audience. But I thought Lakeith Stanfield was fantastic oh, yeah. showing the, so in the NPR podcast I listened to, they said that Lakeith Stanfield had done an interview stating that he had watched, I believe the only known interview with Bill O'Neill from the late 80s, early 90s, before he committed suicide. Um, and the way Lakeith Stanfield interpreted that interview, which, you know, a couple minutes of it were shown at the end of Judas and the Black Messiah, he interpreted that as Bill O'Neill being completely in denial about what he had done. And so he wanted to bring, like, inner conflict to mm-hmm. the character. Um, instead of him just being like all swagger and being like, yeah, you know, I sold this guy out for 200 bucks in a gas station or whatever, you know, he didn't want to be defiant. He wanted to show the turmoil. Mm -hmm. And I thought he did a great job at that. In the beginning, he was like enjoying the steak dinners and the scotch and the Mm -hmm. money. And then by the end, he's just sweaty and drawn and he's really conflicted. And I thought he was phenomenal. Jesse Plemons is sleazy but i mean <laughs> but effective yeah but effective I, I i thought he did a very good job as well mm-hmm. um i dominique fishback also did mm-hmm. a very good job i i thought their love story wasn't as well developed as it could have been now i didn't want like a three and a half hour the irishman type marathon <laughs> but who does right but i thought they sh- the filmmakers did a good job of showing how those two got together mm-hmm. but then suddenly it's she's pregnant and they're talking about having five more kids right, right before the assassination. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, how did yeah. we get from point A to point D? Right. You know, where's like, I know he's been in prison. So have they just been writing a lot of letters to each other that have gotten intercepted by the FBI? Like, I don't know. So mm-hmm. I thought the love story wasn't as well developed as it could have been. But I did also like um, that they... I mean, they didn't sugarcoat what the FBI did no. at all. Like so much of American history just glosses over oppression mm-hmm. and violence and murder. Mm-hmm. And they did not sugarcoat any of this at all. Like they showed J. Edgar Hoover in front of thousands of FBI agents talking about how it's the end of the world as we know it if black people <laughs> aren't oppressed anymore. Right. And I mean, I know the barest of bare minimums about J. Edgar Hoover, and I knew that he was a sleaze bag. And, you know, the fact that we have any monuments or buildings named after him is needs to be changed. But that's an aside. But, <laughs> you know, yeah, so I thought uh, it it did a really good job of showing just the systemic racism and mm-hmm. systemic oppression that exists 50 years ago and still exists now. And uh, I also enjoyed the scene where... Um, the Black Panthers walked into a meeting of a bunch of like racist rednecks mm-hmm. with like a Confederate flag hanging right. on the back. And I'm like, bro, like you walked in there without guns. Like, yeah. what are you doing? How's this going to go? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, he he was so charismatic. He was able to forge the rainbow coalition mm-hmm. of, you know, black people and Hispanic people and poor, you know, disaffected white people mm-hmm. who don't, you know, they just want a fair shake. Mm-hmm. Like they just want everybody to be treated equally. And, you know, I feel like so much of like movies about, about black Panthers are just show them, you know, being violent. And I'm like, well, right. if you were oppressed and you wanted your rights, you'd be violent as well. Right. So I, I, I'm not uh, in any way, shape or form in a position to talk about race in this regard, but right, I can understand why you'd be fed up if you're right. constantly told that you're not equal, constantly denied uh, access to things that other people are getting access to. And you're in a country that is touting being land of the free and home of the brave. And yet you can't vote and you, because of all these voter suppression laws. And you have to and, go to different bathrooms and you have all right. these, th- these things that are just terrible. Like I can understand why people at that time got upset. And it wasn't like a violent militant organization. Like they were focusing on building a medical clinic for poor people who couldn't afford to go to doctors. And they were, 
you know, feeding children like breakfast programs before the kids went to school because, you know, some people, their school lunch is their only meal of the day because, mm-hmm. you know, they're poor. So they were, it was community organization, but you get all these groups coming together and rising up and that threatens the white patriarchal power structure. And so J. Edgar has to put his boot on the neck. Well, and also when you get groups, uh, as uh, Fred Hampton did in this case, uh, or at least documented in the movie, you get so many people together, they're going to be bad apples that are going to infiltrate those groups. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to be portrayed as being the the model rather than the exception. So when you have somebody acting out of a group, like any group uh, of any size, you're going to get people that are radicals or or going to use it for the wrong purposes or Mm -hmm. personal gain or something like that or to make a name for themselves. And so when you have that kind of thing, the the media is going to take it at that time and portray it as like, these are the people that represent this group. And actually, that's not the case. I will say one thing about the... When you mentioned about uh, Fred Hampton convincing the other parties, like the the Confederate flag guys and the Hispanic guys, and the other uh, the Crowns, I think they were was another yeah. uh, rival uh, group in in Chicago at the time. I thought that that was a little bit. I don't know how I didn't really believe it as much. I, I thought it was too easy for him to mm-hmm. convince everybody. Like I did, I I believed his. His char- you know, the, the charisma that he had, mm-hmm. I, he showed that, but it wasn't strong enough in those instances to me. I was just like, there's no way he's going to walk into this meeting with all these white people and convince them to, right. like, I just, especially in the 60s, like in, in this day and age, in the, in the 70s, when racism was so much more dangerous than it is now. Um, but I still, I still thought it was interesting the way that they developed that uh, group and the Rainbow Faction and everything like that, Rainbow Coalition. So it was... Uh, it was very interesting and very well done in a lot of ways, but it just didn't, I don't know, it just didn't bubble up to great to me. It was just, it was a good movie and mm-hmm. it was fine, but, and the, the performances, all the performances you mentioned were all great. I agree with that. It's just, for me, it just didn't, uh, it didn't rise to the next level for some reason. It was two hours and five minutes long. I think that was, that was right. Yeah, me It too. didn't feel draggy. Mm-hmm. It, I, except for like, a, you know, I mean, I could have watched more of it, mm-hmm. but there weren't any parts where I was just like, uh, you know, why do we have this in here? You mm-hmm. know, if it, it, it felt right to me. So, yeah, it felt a little draggy to me, but that was just, uh, I think it was more because we're used to watching different kinds of movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and every now and then we'll jump into a movie like this, which is an actual, you know, you got to pay attention you got to think about it. Like the time that we were watching a bunch of movies and then I broke free and I watched Lincoln for, uh, <laughs> For some reason, and I was like, oh, man, this is the longest movie in history. And it wasn't right. actually, it was, you know, it was two and change, I think. But it was just because we were so used to watching these other movies that are mm. all so fast paced. And right. One scene to the next is, is action. So, um, yeah, I, I, I thought the pace was good. And uh, I thought everything was pretty true. I uh, the, the music, the scenery, the sets, everything seemed to be pretty, pretty legit. Yeah. So what grade would you give it overall? <laughs> on your on your different grading scale from for, week to week. What? For every podcast. <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm going to rate this four apples out of five. <laughs> no, I think this is probably, uh, I'd say this is about a six for me. Oh, okay. I, you know, I, I, I appreciated the acting and mm-hmm. the story is a very important story to tell. I just, uh, for, like I said, uh, some was not there of the parts. How about you, Coco? What was your uh, letter grade? I'd give it like a solid B. Yeah. Yeah. I was expecting to enjoy it more than I actually did, Mm -hmm. but the performances were outstanding. Mm -hmm. So I hope Lakeith Stanfield gets nominated for all the awards. Daniel Kaluuya too. He Mm -hmm. was, he's phenomenal in everything he does. One more note um, on the NPR podcast, apparently the assassination scene at the end when the cops raid the apartment that the Panthers are staying in. Which was very powerful. Which was extremely, like I was, I don't think I breathed during Mm -hmm. that scene. Mm -hmm. Apparently that is taken like almost word for word from Deborah Johnson's Mm -hmm. like recollections of that evening. So that's apparently extremely true to life and that's terrifying that felt authentic to me that that yeah. whole scene that whole situation where they storm the apartment and they uh, you know they're terrorizing the fbi's essentially terrorizing the people inside the apartment that who felt, were sleeping yeah they were and they were not uh, anywhere close to being confrontational no um that felt really good to me that felt authentic to me yeah definitely that's we need we need more movies that show 
the dark side because not everything is rah rah founding mm-hmm. fathers awesome like we need more we need to reckon with history and what i i was thinking about that during that scene i'm like all like i'm an american citizen i'm a taxpayer all this stuff is done with my tax money right. in my name you know yep. law enforcement agencies are just carrying out political assassinations mm-hmm. for no reason whatsoever and we need a you know we need a reckoning with that yeah i agree with that so on that cheerful note so uh that's uh that's it for this edition of the podcast thank you for joining us listener we appreciate it and we also appreciate the many many downloads we have had downloads and we've had a download in iceland awesome we've had downloads all across the world actually so we appreciate that i don't know how you're doing it listener traveling to all these places in the (laughs) pandemic but thanks for doing that and downloading us on multiple different uh devices right (laughs) It's amazing. That's awesome. You must be like Mark Zuckerberg. That's a pretty good listener we've got, let me (laughs) tell you. Yeah. So for another episode, thank you for listening. I'm not Daltz. And I'm not Coco. 